Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good Hello. morning. Good morning. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us for another great talk. Uh, today I'm here, I'm Maira Tedeschi, and I'm here with Mariana Madeiro, uh, Mariana Madeiro, uh, Brenda Rocha, and Bruno Ribeiro to receive our special guest, Pierre Lanari from University of Bern. Hello. Thank you for joining us, Pierre. Uh, Hello, everybody. Yes. It's Bruno. Oh, okay. Uh, so I just wanted to introduce Petrocornix for everyone who doesn't know us. Uh, the Petrocornix is a Brazilian initiative with an international network of collaborators focused on investigating and scientific dissemination of petrochronology and their power to unravel the geodynamic evolution of our, our planet. And our team is very multidisciplinary and ranges from different countries, including Brazil, USA, Australia, Italy, Germany, and Switzerland. Uh, we promote courses and workshops and talks which are open to the community in order to promote geoscience as well as to create collaborations network among researchers working on petrochronology, geodynamics, and related fields. So if you are interested on petrochronology and in our group, just follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter to keep updated on our activities. Okay, Hello, good morning. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our PTT Talk 9. Sorry, Brenda, I interrupt you. The, the PTT Talk is a series of talks about analytical techniques, petrochronology, petrology, and geochronology applied to understanding the geodynamic evolution of our planet. So here we are again with another great talk. Thank you, Pierre, for accepting the invitation and being our speaker today. Good morning, Pierre. Good morning, everyone. So uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction about Professor Pierre Lanari. He's currently uh, an assistant professor at the University of Bern in Switzerland, and he obtained his uh, bachelor's degree in geology at the University of Savoie in France and his master's and PhD degrees uh, in geology from the University of Grenoble in France. And he has been doing research and uh, publishing remarkable work in computational petrology and geochemistry. So his recent uh, achievements involve the development of computer tools and thermodynamic models at the basis of process-oriented studies aiming to further improve the understanding of complex metamorphic systems. Uh, he also conducts the um, ERC research project called Promoting, which is um, Prograde Metamorphic Modeling, a new petrochronology, petrochronological and com computing uh, framework. So um, thank you, Pierre, for being our guest today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, and Pierre's talk is um, a geek approach for the quantification and simulation of metamorphies. So thank you. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Brenda, for the nice introduction. Uh, Bruno, Mariana, and Maira, and all of you for inviting me. Uh, it's a it's a really great pleasure to be here today and to talk about uh, the science that we are doing here in Bern. And um, I want also to thank you for this very cool initiative. So I've been watching a few of the the previous Petroconics uh, talks, and uh, it's a really cool initiative. And I'm really glad and honored to be presenting uh, today. But so before to start with the the, the the talk in the science, uh, I want to briefly uh, thanks also some other people that uh, are involved in the research, are involved in the, the, the results that I'm going to show today. Uh, I rank them by uh, career or, the, or level. We have the, the mentors at the top, and then we have the colleagues uh, in the middle and the PhD students at the bottom. And I, I won't go through the list, but uh, I, I will present many things that have been uh, either inspired or directly done by people that appear on this uh, on this page. And also, I need to uh, thank the uh, University of Bern and the Canton Bern, of course, for 
the amazing uh, facilities and working conditions that we have here in Bern, as well as some uh, funding agencies, the Swiss National Science Foundation and European Research Council, that makes uh, the this research possible. Okay, so uh, you are all uh, here working with metamorphism, so I won't tell you what metamorphism is, but uh, to me, it's, what is important is two parts of uh, metamorphism. First, of course, the transformation of the solids. That's what happened when you uh, transport material from the earth surface to the deep earth uh, upon increasing pressure and temperature conditions. So you form new minerals, you have those solid transformation. They result in uh, densification, usually, of the material. So this is important, and that's why the Petrochronics network exists, because this has effect, uh, this affect, of course, the tectonics, the geodynamic of our planet. So this is important. But also we have a second aspect that is that yeah, the tr solid transformations they are occurring in a closed system. But, but we have a second aspect that is the production of fluids. Uh, two types of fluid, the aqueous fluid, mostly H2 uh, for the at the beginning, a low grade to medium grade, and then at high grade metamorphic conditions will produce land. And this makes the total picture makes metamorphism as really a major process in, in the earth interior and in the lithosphere. And I want really to emphasize this because we have a quite vibrant community uh, in metamorphic petrology and people that are uh, studying metamorphism for uh, many reasons. And it is because the process is really important. And traditionally, we have had two different approaches to study metamorphism. The first one is a naturalist approach. So to look at uh, minerals and rocks and uh, to try to understand um, how uh, the minerals uh, change with pressure and temperature conditions. So we can look at the rocks that are in the, in the mountain beds uh, that we collect in the metamorphic beds. And more recently, in the, in the last, let's say, 40, 40 years, uh, they, there, there was a drift, uh, a shift from uh, the observations of the naturalist approach to a more quantitative approach with the simulation of metamorphic processes. And this is very important because I think one of the reasons why the field is so successful is because we have all this work in uh, the simulation. And I put it here, this map that I created for a phase equilibrium workshop. And I don't want to go into the details because there, there, there is a lot of information in this figure. But basically, we have the two main islands in the middle of the map is showing the principal thermodynamic databases and modeling tools. And the most important are the two islands in the middle uh, that are two groups, Orlan and Powell on the left and Berman on the right. And those people, they build thermodynamic databases and modeling programs that has been used by thousands of, of colleagues, thousands of people. And that was really the foundation of the modern approach of metamorphic petrology. As well, important are the two big boards that are the Gibbs Energy Minimizer, uh, Tyac Domino, the bottom perplex on the top left. And they are also important because they generated some interest. And many people, including myself, have developed programs that are connected to uh, Tyac Domino or perplex. And this, in, this is to me really the foundation of uh, the success of metamorphic petrology and that it, it is still today a very active uh, discipline. So what do we do with all those tools? Um, most of the time we do pressure temperature estimates. And yeah, I took a figure from the last paper from Mike Braun to, that summarize this the uh, pressure temperature conditions of peak metamorphism for about 564 localities, for which Mike determined that we have a robust uh, pressure temperature estimate. So this is amazing. We have 564 localities for which we know exactly or oh, very precisely the condition of peak metamorphism. And this is fantastic. And this, is, this would be impossible without the tools that I mentioned just before. And then Mike makes different groups, the low TP ratio that are associated to subduction, uh, the intermediate TP ratio, the high TP ratio that are more for uh, orogenic uh, uh, plateaus or back arc settings. Anyhow, that tells us what's happening or what's the link between metamorphism and the tectonic uh, settings. 
And then if you have some timing, if you have some ages uh, for each of those uh, uh, different localities, you can start to see how the, the, the conditions, the tectonic conditions, for example, at, at the surface of our planet or in the outer shell of our planet have evolved uh, through time. And this is the, fa the, the, the figure from Mike. And there are many teams working on that at the moment. And again, all this relies on the precise pressure and temperature estimate that we have. You mentioned in the introduction petrochronology, and it is important because knowing the peak conditions for uh, several uh, localities is important, but what we are also interested is to know the pressure, temperature, time evolution of one locality. And this is an example of one locality in the Alps, that is the ultra high pressure unit of Torameira. It is for, for me very important because it's one of the best constraints in the world in, term, in terms of PTT conditions. And you see that in the summary figures, we have six different uh, rock types that have been studied. They all record very similar pressure, temperature, time path. Uh, with the timing, we can come back to uh, burial and exhumation rates. They are shown on the, the insert on the top left. And it is interesting because in this case, the burial and exhumation rates are much faster than the plate velocity, the horizontal uh, plate velocities, which means that we need a process that goes faster than the convergence rate to bury and exhume those rocks. And this has triggered a lot of thinking with people working with, uh, for example, geodynamic or tectonic to try to understand this petrological record. So for me, the, the discipline is successful because we have been doing a lot of pressure temperature estimates, but uh, although this is very important, uh, we have new big questions that have emerged and the impact of metamorphic petrology goes to them much uh, further than just doing thermal barometry. This is, yeah, I summarized a few uh, important uh, aspects of the petrological models, for example, and possible application across the geosciences. As I said, it's very important for the mechanical models when you have this uh, uh, PTT path that tells you that the, the rocks are buried faster than uh, the convergence rate, then you, you need to reproduce that with your mechanical model. And, and those are important constraints to try to test the validity of the models. It is very important to simulate uh, what's happening in the crust, in the lithosphere, to model, for example, the mass transfers, uh, to simulate crustal recycling and interpret the main geochemical signals. But on a more recent to, uh, perspective, it's also very important to understand element cycles, so volatiles. Uh, how do we uh, transport volatiles down in uh, the mantle? How do we extract the volatiles and bring them back to the surface? And one of the questions I'm particularly interested in at the moment is how the H2O is distributed within the lithosphere, because this would have an impact on uh, the localization of earthquakes, as well as on the evolution of the rheology of the lithosphere. And this is important. If you, dance, if, if you, if you add water to a rock, you would change the, the density. If you increase the density, the rock can go down. If you um, um, basically uh, decrease the density, the rock can go up, which could create a mountain that would affect the climate. So there are many impacts on uh, what we can do or what we can do if we understand better what happens in the lithosphere. And metamorphism is the main process there. So now I want uh, to come back to this very simple sketch of metamorphism and, they, and say, of course, we understood many things. And there are many things that we understand. We understand, for example, the peak pressure and temperature conditions of those uh, uh, localities. But to me, there are a few questions that remains um, not completely unsolved, but that sometimes we forget to, to, to ask. And the first question is, most of the PT estimates I have sh uh, shown before that are used by Mike Brown uh, come from um, assuming that equilibrium thermodynamics is the most adequate uh, physical framework to simulate lomorphic processes. The question is, is that uh, completely true? Of course, you know already the answer. It's probably yes, because we are using this framework quite a lot when we want to understand uh, metamorphism, when we want to obtain uh, pressure and temperature conditions. 
but I, I'll show you that sometimes you need to be careful. And especially when you want to apply this for thermobarometry to natural rocks. And that would be uh, a large part of my presentation. And then the second question is, uh, we understand quite well how the solid part of the system is evolving uh, through time during a metamorphic cycle, for example. What is a bit less uh, constrained at the moment is what is the impact of the fluid, especially the aqueous fluid. So the second question is how can we use the petrological model to try to trace fluid rock interaction processes uh, and try to understand if, if, for example, a fluid has traveled uh, through a rock. And this is important, but if you want to answer uh, this question, you need to couple pathological models, geochemical models, and mechanical models. And I'm also going to talk a bit about that. So my approach is to have a, uh, to apply computational petrology. That's my geek approach. And I apply computational petrology from the chemical analysis to the numerical simulation of uh, metamorphic or petrological and geochemical processes. So it's really a, a two sides of a coin. The first side is uh, the observations. The observations are uh, how you extract information from the rocks. That's the con constraints that you will use. And for that, we develop new analytical techniques and data reduction routines. And I will show you many examples of that. For example, to go from semi-quantitative to fully quantitative data, to go from major to trace element, or to run an analysis in 2D or 3D, that could be important. And the second aspect, after you have very good constraints from your observations, is the simulation, so the modeling part. And for that, I would like to distinguish two different parts. The modeling for thermobarometry, where you need to be very precise, and for that, uh, I have contributed with the development of methods and computer tools for thermobarometry. But also, if you want to simulate petrogeochemical processes, and this is a bit different than thermobarometry because you don't need uh, the same uh, degree of precision. And I will present you an integrated modeling framework for free rock interaction uh, using isotopes. But something that I always kept in mind uh, I, I always keep in mind when I'm uh, trying to uh, develop new computational tools is that we need to keep a more intimate link between the observations that are our constraints and the models that we develop. And this is a, a long-term goal that I apply uh, when I'm uh, working and trying to develop the tools. So this presentation will be essentially focused uh, around the tools and there are several of them I'm going to talk about today. The first one on the left is XMAP Tools. It's a, a software solution for processing uh, chemical maps, uh, compositional maps. Then, so the, those are the observations. Then we will focus on the modeling for uh, thermobarometry, and I will present the concept of iterative thermodynamic models. And this is very good if you want to apply thermobarometry in domainal rocks. And then the third part of this presentation will be on a, a modeling package that includes a database plus modeling tools uh, for petrogeochemical modeling, and especially focused on the free rock uh, interaction processes. So that's about what I'm going to present. And let's start with the first part that is XMAP tools. So XMAP tools is a software, but before I show you the software, I need to explain exactly what we want to, to do and what the goal is. The goal is to calibrate uh, data that you easily acquire with an instrument uh, that is using X-rays, such as the electron micro. So on the left of this figure, you have some semi-quantitative data. And the image shows you uh, the distribution of uh, silicon, and the unit is X-ray count. So it's the number of X-rays reaching your detector. And this map was acquired with an uh, EPMA, an electron microprobe. It has about 350,000 pixels for 15 elements, and it takes between one night and two days, so 10 to 40 hours, to measure this uh, a map of this size. I didn't show you the size, but it's about a few millimeters. So it's a quite small map. 
but the data that you have in this uh, image are semi-quantitative. If you want to make it quantitative, there are several steps, and that's what I call the data processing. The first step is to classify the image, and you see the second image on this figure is a mask ima image that shows you the distribution of the different minerals. This is the result of the classification. Then you need to calibrate your maps, and the third image shows you the distribution of silica in weight percentage. So this is a quantitative map now. And then you can do normalization. You can calculate, for example, a structural formula. And I'm showing you an example of uh, clinopyroxene. This is the distribution of sodium in atom per formula unit in your clinopyroxene. And you can see an omphacite in red that has an X jadeite of 0.4, and then a decrease of the sodium content in this uh, texture that is a simple type. So to calculate those maps, uh, if you use XMAP tools, you need between one and three hours. So maximum one afternoon to simply calculate all those maps and generate the figures or the images that you would need for your figures. And this is exactly the purpose of the program. So the program comes with a, a graphical user interface because you are handling compositional data. So you need to visualize what you are doing. And it is a guided environment. So it will help you to go through the the different steps of the processing uh, thanks to this uh, graphical user interface. So if I want to summarize what XMAP Tools is doing at the moment, uh, I would say that it's a, a program that is uh, widely compatible. So you can use data coming from a, a, a large variety of instruments, uh, provided that you transform data to the XMAP Tools format. You can use electron microprobe analysis, uh, SCM, uh, data, laser ab ablation, ICPMS data, or even if you have any other instrument such as a micro X-ray fluorescent, you can also use the data in XMAP tools. And you can calibrate the data if you have some uh, spot analysis on the same area. So we use internal standards, we use spot analysis on the same area to calibrate uh, our maps. The program uh, provides you some tools for quantitative petrology. There are several dedicated modules uh, to visualize the data and uh, uh, change between different spaces. You have different workspaces, depending on if you work with raw data or, or quantitative data. We developed some add-ons, including one for thermodynamic modeling. I'm going to present you that a bit later on. And we have a lot of external function. For example, to calculate the structural formula of clinopyroxene, taking into account the iron 3 plus, and to calculate n member fractions. This is something we have a function in the program, it will do it for you. The program is free for academic research and it has a large pool of users today, uh, which means that it has been tested several times. So, this is something that is quite good. And in addition, I would say that it's a program that is made by a petrologist. So, it is really uh, dedicated, uh, the goal of the program is really to be easy for people doing uh, metamorphic petrology. So it's not like commercial software that is developed with the purpose of selling to industry. So it's really a software uh, for petrologists. But XMATURS has been doing quite well over the past uh, 10 years, I would say. I think the, the first version was released about uh, nine years ago. And the problem is that it has grown on um, uh, a small project at the beginning and it became a huge boat. And now the problem is it is not so easy to keep growing. So we decided uh, one year ago uh, in collaboration with uh, Maira that is here uh, in the panel and uh, with uh, Joshua Longton, we decided to start over from zero and to develop a new version of XMAP tools. And this will be released very soon as uh, XMAP tools version four. That will be much simpler on the user side that will be faster, which means that this data processing of one to three hours will be reduced to less than one hour. And now I can easily handle a, comp a project, a full project in about 20 to 30 minutes to do all the steps of the processing. And so I hope it will be better for you. And this is something we are going to announce in, in the next weeks, but I want to, to give you today a few um, ideas of what the program will do. So it will come as a XMAP tools for beta. That will be a beta version available for everyone to test. 
It comes with a fully redesigned uh, graphical user interface. So we started from scratch and it will be completely different to uh, what you are used to if you are already using XMAP tools. We implemented some modern interaction tools. So what you do can be edited and it gets uh, much easier on the, uh, to process your data. We implemented some mach machine learning algorithms, uh, for example, that makes the classification mu much easier and much more powerful. Now we don't have any more uh, problems of classification in the maps, even though the, the, the data sets are uh, very complex. The program will be natively compatible with a lot of data coming from instrument. For example, Geol and Chemica Microprobe, you will be able to directly read the data from the microprobe and import them uh, in XMAP tools. And we are working on improving the compatibility with other software, such as probe software, or uh, working with Zeiss to make also the data uh, fully compatible. So even if you calibrate your maps with an older software, you can still easily import an, an XMAP tools for all the post-processing. The program will be fully compatible with laser ICPMS data and something new is that it will be possible to calibrate your maps directly in XMAP tools. So you don't have to do the calibration before using an, uh, a commercial software. You will be able to do it completely in XMAP tools. And we try to really uh, uh, change or uh, really improve the way that this calibration is done. It will be also compatible with microtomography data. So that's the going from 2D to 3D. And then we'll give you an example in a, a few minutes. We also collaborated with uh, Joshua Longton to, uh, to import his uh, PT toolbox inside XMAP tools. And I'm really happy to announce that there will be much more functions that uh, compared to the, the, the previous versions of the program. So many new functionalities for petrologists will be implemented in the new version. We have rethought also the help and training material. It would be an integrated user guide and resources website. And we hope we will produce video tutorials and video, virtual classes on how to get started with XMAP tools. And finally, the most important for the user side, it comes as standalone apps for macOS and Windows. So you will no longer need MATLAB to run XMAP tools. It will be independent. And the program will remain completely free and it will be open source, which means that uh, you uh, will be able to access the codes through GitHub and to uh, take part of the project if you are interested in it. So everything will be completely open uh, from the release of this XMAP tools for beta. So we are going to announce that very soon. Stay tuned. If you want to have more information, we will uh, make some announcement on uh, Twitter. Uh, so you can follow us on Twitter or also on the new website for this new version that would be xmaptools.ch. So this is an exciting part of the of the of my research to produce tools and to give it to the to the community. But I think it's it's also now time to come back to a bit more scientific aspects. And why is it so important to use quantitative compositional maps, especially if you are doing uh, petrochronology? So if you are doing petrochronology, why should you consider instead of using simply spot analysis and one transect in your garnet? Why should you consider moving to compositional maps? And this comes back to the first question I asked at the beginning of my presentation. Is equilibrium thermodynamic the right framework to simulate metamorphism? Well, what is uh, thermodynamic equilibrium? Thermodynamic equilibrium is three conditions. The first one is thermal equilibrium at the scale of your system, at the scale of your rock, this is okay. Uh, pressure. A mechanical equilibrium, so the pressure should be constant at the scale of your rock. That can be discussed, but we could assume for this talk that it is okay. And then the third one is the chemical equilibrium. And chemical equilibrium means that all the minerals that you see in your system will be in equilibrium together at any given pressure and temperature conditions. So it means that they, you should not preserve any compositional zoning because they have only one composition at, of each mineral at one PT that is the stable state. So in this case, it's very simple. You can use Gibbs energy minimization and an internally consistent database to simulate metamorphism. And as the composition of your system, because you need in the minimization to have a bulk composition, you can use the bulk composition of your rock. So this is pretty straightforward. But we know that metamorphism is not uh, 
happening at chemical equilibrium. For example, if I take my virtual system here, I increase pressure and temperature, something would happen. The minerals will react, will react to converge to a new equilibrium state. And if we take, for example, the reaction chloride plus muscovite plus quartz gives garnet plus biotite plus H2O, then you need to dissolve the chloride, you need to dissolve the muscovite and some quartz to transport the nutrients from the dissolution side to the precipitation side. In this example, for example, to grow garnet. And this is a, a disequilibrium process because we have transport that is unquote. But if the transport is fast enough, what we can or what we assume and what you assume if you do some phase equilibrium modeling is that you reach some kind of equilibrium in your grain boundary network, in this intergranular medium. And we call this concept the concept of grain boundary equilibrium. And if this is the case, it means that all the growing minerals are in equilibrium. Therefore, they have exactly the same compositions. And this is something we can test with compositional maps. But before, just to say, what can also happen is that, for example, the garnet is zoned chemically. So the interior of the garnet would not be in, equ in equilibrium with what ha happened in the intergranular medium. So this is the, the difference between a global equilibrium assumption, what you have on the left, and the local equilibrium assumption, what you have on the right. And for the local equilibrium, you can use Gibbs energy minimization, but one has to be careful because uh, if you have mineral verdicts, then you should not use the bulk composition of uh, your systems, of your work, and you need to use a reactive bulk composition that would be the bulk composition of this intergranular medium. And at least this model is compatible with the presence of relics, and this is quite important. But let's see how we can test easily the grain boundary equilibrium model, so this local equilibrium. But it's very simple. If you have a sample and you want to know if this was the case, what you can do is you can map, for example, the thin section, the entire thin section, and see if the zoning pattern that you observe in one grain is repeated to all the grains across the thin section. This is an example of a map, a garnet map. Uh, we have two different images. The one on the left is calcium in the per formula unit. The one on the right is the XMG. It's magnesium divided by magnesium plus iron. And what we see is that the zoning pattern is repeated for all the grains across the size of the thin section. So probably the grain binary chemical equilibrium assumption is valid for this sample and some sort of equilibrium was approached at the centimeter scale. What we also see is that we need, in this case, to apply a local equilibrium model because we have the presence of unreacted interior. We still preserve compositional zoning in the interior of the grain. And we have a bit of diffusion. So if you compare the two images, you will see that the one on the left, the calcium, is a bit more sharp in the transition, especially between this mantle that is bluish to the, the first green that is reddish, you see a very sharp transition. Whereas in the XMG, the transition is less sharp, which means that the original composition was modified by diffusion. It's a post-growth modification. And this is important as well, because you want to make sure that the, the composition you use for modeling is uh, reflecting the growth condition, especially if you want to do pressure temperature uh, conditions of the growth of this garment. So this is the first example. It's pretty simple. If we take now a second example that's a bit more complicated, again, it's a map of different garnet grains. It's again the scale of a thin section. If you look at the scale, it's a, a few centimeters uh, in vertical and two centimeters horizontal for this map. And we are looking at X, uh, X pyrope, so the magnesium content of the garment. And here we have a surprise because something is not working as we would expect. We have a gradual zoning in the X pyrope at the centimeter scale in the sample. And this is a problem because it means what, what is the composition that we should use uh, of the garnet to try to find, for example, pressure temperature conditions for this sample. Okay. If you do only a few spot analysis, depending on where you do them in the thin section, it would affect your results because the exchanging of about uh, 0.1 uh, in the fraction of uh, pi. So it's 10 percent. Huh? The, in this case, uh, it is very complex because we don't know if this is a, a result of growth condition. So if, for example, the garnet grew with different composition across the different zones, 
or if it was modified after by diffusion, but that the conditions of diffusions were different in the different zones. So it's a bit complicated to, to interpret this. But what I just want to say is be careful. And if you have quantitative compositional maps of your sample, you might discover things like that, that will ask more questions. And this is very important. So if, if I generalize this, and now we have done quite a lot of compositional maps, and I want to show you this one, that is a summary of uh, uh, three different maps of three different samples uh, with peak metamorphic conditions going from 620 degrees on the left to uh, 800 degrees on the right and 680 degrees to 780 degrees in the center. And all the rocks are metapilite, and we are looking at plagioclase, the ex albite in plagioclase. And what you see is the plagioclase are always zones. So we did the work, we investigated those three samples in details, and that was published in a, in a few papers. And what we realized that when we, con when we constrain the peak conditions, so the peak condition that Mike Brown is using in this, in this figure for the localities, uh, we realized that a large part of the rock was not re-equilibrated at peak conditions. And in fact, uh, on the first sample, only 50 volume percent of the rock was re-equilibrated at peak conditions. And the other, the other part was uh, metastable relics that were not reacting to reach equilibrium. Uh, in the center, it increases. We have 77 per volume percent of the rock that was re-equilibrated at peak condition. And at the right, we have about 60 volume percent. So it's even going down with increasing uh, temperature. And this is very important because it will affect your uh, thermobarometry, whatever model you used. For example, if you use an inverse model, if you want to estimate the pressure conditions for the sample for the peak, and you use the GASP uh, barometer, then of course the plagioclase composition that you pick is important. If the plagioclase was not re-equilibrated at the peak condition, it would matter. It would affect your estimate. If you use a forward model and you have 50% volume percent of your rock that was not re-equilibrated at the peak, the reactive bulk composition might be far away from your bulk rock composition, which means that the model based on bulk rock composition might be uh, inaccurate. And this, those are questions that are very important, especially if you're interested in uh, pressure temperature estimates. So, what we did then after that, realizing this, is to say, okay, how, how can we try to improve that? How, how can we try to, to determine for different samples what is the, the geometry of the equilibrium volume and what is the composition that we should use in our forward model? And this is the second software I'm going to talk about that is being wanted at, and it's exactly the purpose of trying to do that. So we built a bit a new a modeling fr framework that we call iterative thermodynamic models. It's pretty easy to understand why we call it iterative. It's because it's based on a forward model and we are using a uh, Tariac Domino to run Gibbs energy minimization. But then we take all the prediction of uh, Tariac Domino, so the mineral assemblage for any pressure temperature and bulk uh, composition we take the mineral assemblage, the mineral modes, that's the volume fraction of each phase, and the mineral compositions, including all the composition, not just two isoplates, but all the compositions. And then we compare these outcomes of the model with the observations that we have from our rocks, from our compositional map. If you do the, the, the comparison quantitatively, you can calculate a misfit parameter and then you can run an iterative optimization that will refine pressure and temperature to try to minimize this misfit. And when you reach the value of zero, it means that your observations and the model's outcome are purely identical. So Bingo Antidote is a program running these iterative thermodynamic models. It has two parts in it. The first part is called Bingo, and this is the scoring strategy. This is the, pro the part of the program that will calculate this misfit parameter. And the scoring uh, strategy is based on three, what we call model quality factors. And we have three of them, the QASM, that is the quality of the assemblage. It tells you how good the assemblage of the model is compared to your observation. Then we have the Q volume, tells you how good the mineral modes, the volume fraction of your minerals are in the model compared to what you observe. 
and the same for all the mineral composition. And those three model quality factors, they range in value between zero, very terrible quality, and 100%. So 100% means the model is perfectly reproducing my observations with an uncertainty. And then we have one more uh, model quality factor, Q total, that is based on the three uh, independent quality factors. And that will quantify our misfit. When the value of Q total is 100%, the model is perfectly reproducing with an uncertainty what we observe. It is integrated in X matters as an X matters add on, which means that Bing Antidote can uh, readily handle compositional maps. So you can select an area on any part of your, of your map and say, let's extract the local bulk composition from this area, but let's also extract the mineral modes from this area and the mineral composition with the associated uncertainties. And this is why it's so easy to use Bing Antidote if you use compositional maps, because you can try different domains. And this is something that you can do very quickly. The second part of the program is Antidote. Antidote does the inversion. This is the iterative model, the iterative part of the model, and it contains many recipes. I don't want to give a, a list of everything that Antidote can do, but just to give you a few ideas, it can derive optimal pressure temperature conditions for one specific case. You can map the functions in the different PT spaces. Uh, you can approximate uncertainties, for example, uncertainties on the domain that you select or uncertainties in PT. And you can, you have a mode to map some, uh, to generate some maps of chemical potential gradients. And this is all uh, reported in the paper we published with Eric Durstoff. That was my, uh, the co-developer of Bing Antidote. So let's go for an example. Uh, this is the, uh, a sample from Himalaya metapilite. It's when I showed you the maps of the plagio place, it was the one on the right, the, the one with the peak conditions at 800 degrees. And if you do, if you take a map of, uh, again, a few uh, uh, square centimeters of your sample, and this is what is shown on the left, you select an area and then you can run with antidote an optimization of the program will find the optimal PT conditions. This means optimal from a statistical point of view. That's the point in the PT space where the value of the Q total is a maximum. And we have a QASM of 100%. It's a perfect match in terms of assemblage. The Q volume is 98%. You can see on the small diagrams below, you have the observation on the left, the model on the right. And you can see that they are purely identical. So it's a very good match in terms of uh, mineral modes. And then for the mineral compositions, it's a bit less good. It's 87%, but it's still reasonable, which makes a Q total of 95%. This is a, a quite good model. But of course, you, I, the, the main comment is, yeah, but you selected this area. What happens if you change the area? And this is exactly the power of being wanted out, is that you can try different areas. Then I thought, oh, let's exclude the silimonite. That's the green minerals that is always associated to quartz in this case. So I took another domain, as you can see on this figure, it's a, it, you get a new local bulk composition, and I do again an optimization at the same PT conditions, and I calculate the QASM, Q volume and QCMP values. And as you can see first on the pie diagrams, you see that now the model has changed drastically. And if, if I come back to the one before, now you see with the silimonite, and if I go to the next one, you see how the model will change depending on what you put in your domain or what you put as input in the bulk composition of your system. But something interesting is that the QCMP value uh, now is lower. We are at 81%, whereas we were at 87% for the previous case. And this means that somehow the global quality of my model is decreasing when I change the domain. And what happens in this case, you already have the answer because I told you that part of the rock was not equilibrated for this specific case. And it is only 60% of the rock that was in equilibrium at the peak conditions that we tried to model here. And the part that was not are the feldspar. So plagioclase and k feldspar were not fully re-equilibrated at the peak conditions. And this is exactly what happened. If you take a smaller domain where you have a higher proportion of feldspar, uh, in this case, you have a lower uh, model quality factor of QCMP. If you take uh, another domain that is larger, that has less feldspar relatively in your domain, then you have a QCMP value that increases. 
And this is something we can easily demonstrate. Huh? We can demonstrate that with a, a simple a theoretical example. And I want to go through this very quickly, but to show you that the approach is, is valid is if, for example, you, you do a minimization at one PT using a database, a bulk core composition, and if you take the, the outcome of the models as your observation, okay, we take the, the assemblage, mineral compositions, and uh, the modes as our observations. And then we reproduce at the same PT and we change the, we virtually change the domain. So what we do is we take the mineral composition, we change the modes, and we generate a new local bulk composition if you want. It's like playing, selecting different areas on your uh, sample. And what you see is that in this case, the value of the Q total will be always systematically 100%. So it doesn't matter how much plagioclase you consider in the domain, how much garnet you consider in your domain, you will always have a perfect model. And just the modes will change between your fake observations and the model in this case. But more interestingly is what happens if now I change the composition of one of the mineral, I don't take the plagioclase that is predicted to be stable at this condition, but I take a plagioclase that a prograde plagioclase, for example. And this is exactly what happens. And I'm showing you in this diagram, the vertical axis is the QCMP of the minerals. And you see that more plagioclase with the wrong composition you have, the more you go to the right on the X axis, the lower the QCMP value of plagioclase will be, and it affects the garnet, it affects the starlight as well. So it means that the QCMP value total will decrease. And this is exactly what we have seen in the example from the Himalaya. If you take a domain with more plagioclase, you have a lower QCMP value. If you take a domain with less plagioclase, you have a better QCMP values. And this is why the approach is cool, because you can really test for different domains with different mineral proportions. You can see how the model will react to that. And in this example, if you use the bulk of composition, you would have a much lower quality at the peak conditions for the minerals that you try to model that were stable at the peak uh, conditions, such as the gamut in this case. So this is the iterative thermodynamic models. And then after discovering this, we thought, OK, but everything we are doing is in two dimensions. Huh? When, when we do this composition and math, we are looking at a very small slice of the sample in, in a two dimension. And we have cases that are more complex, where we have domains and uh, domainal reactions. Uh, for example, this rock and other metapilites, uh, that was the central part in, in the one uh, with the, the plagioclase zoning. And it, it's a migmatite from Valle di Garduno in the Central Alps. And it is an interesting sample because we have those domains. Huh? We have the leucosome that is different, the matrix that is different, the garnet porphyroblast. And it sounds really familiar to many of you, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So we measure the map, and this is what uh, I show you here. So we have some garnet, plagioclase, a bit of biotite. And the interesting aspect is that we run bingo antidote on that, and you easily uh, obtain the peak conditions around uh, 700 degrees, season 680 to 700 degrees, open eight GPA. And at those conditions, again, the observations are perf perfectly matched by the model. So it's, it's a really good model in this case. And then we thought, yes, but this map is a very small volume. It's a very small surface of the rock. So what happens if, if we do the same in 3D? And so we drill uh, a core of this, uh, of this sample. So this is a one inch diameter uh, uh, core. And then we, did, we, we scanned this core in 3D using a CT scanner. And just to give you an idea, the, the, the map that I showed you is about the volume of this map is about 0.2 uh, cubic millimeter. And then if I take the core or the scan that I have here on this image, just one single image, so one single horizontal image, one slide is about 15 cubic millimeter. So it's two order of magnitude uh, larger, higher than what I use for my microprobe map, which means that it will be even more when you integrate the entire volume. And as I told you, we can do the data processing using the new version of XMAP tools. And that's what we have been doing in this case. And the data processing involves a segmentation. And the segmentation will convert, will extract uh, the type of minerals depending on the CT value. So the gray, uh, the gray scale level that you can see on the image, uh, on, the, on, the, on the volume that we scan. 
And this is a segmented image. I'm just showing you a vertical slides across uh, the volume. And we managed to separate the garnet, the oxide, uh, in this case, the biotite, the plagioclase. And everything that is in red is what we call a leucosome because it's a plagioclase plus quartz. So we really managed to, to separate all those domains. And then by using a calibration of this entire volume, we extracted the bulk composition of the entire volume. And in this case, the volume is uh, about 127,000 uh, cubic uh, millimeter, which means that we are seven order of magnitude higher in terms of volume than the X-ray map, the composition map that we use in Bingo Antidote. And the cool thing is that you, know, you can see how the mineral fractions are changing across the volume here from the left to the right. You see the, the proportion of the different phases, how it changes. You can calculate for every slide the bulk composition. So now we are looking at how the bulk composition is changing uh, depending on how much leucosome, how much uh, garnet we have on one slide. And then we can obtain the bulk chemistry of the sample with somehow an uncertainty if we take the standard deviation of all the values we have in the previous figure in the slides. So, and this is cool because now we have a bulk chemistry of the sample with some uncertainty and we can approximate, we can try to, to quantify what would be the, the consequences on the model side. So how the model would change depending on this uh, composition. This is what we have done. I'm showing you only one uh, case. And this case is how much the garnet in curve, uh, the position of this garnet in curve would change depending on uh, which composition you use. So we simulated for all the bulk composition that we had and we calculated exactly the position uh, in temperature of the garnet in curve. And you see that we have a 24 degree variation depending only on the bulk composition that you use for modeling. And this is what I would call the domain effect on the position of the garnet in curve. And this is important because it means that when you uh, try to estimate the degree of overstepping that you have on a reaction, for example, the garnet in uh, a reaction, then you have to take this effect into account. And in this case, uh, the effect will be variable depending on the reaction you are looking at. Some reaction in the phase diagram will not change much. Some reactions will be uh, highly sensitive to uh, the, this bulk composition. And also in this case, we do not consider the presence of metastable relics. Huh? We ignore that in this example. So coming back to my sketch of um, this uh, forward and inverse models, and I showed you uh, the iterative thermodynamic model that is a combination of the forward and the inverse models. I want now to state that uh, if you do thermobarometry, so if you are interested in the pressure and temperature conditions of a specific sample, then what you use as, a, as an input in the bulk composition can matter. It can be very important, especially if uh, your sample was not fully recalibrated at the PT stage that you try to model. And, and it is important in this case to, uh, to try to really understand what is the best bulk composition I should use to, mod to model this uh, specific stage. But now if you, if you just want to, to simulate metamorphism, so to have a forward model, for example, to reproduce uh, how the minerals will change along the pressure temperature path, then you can easily use the bulk rock composition. And those are two different types of models. The models we use for uh, thermobarometry that must be precise. We are very interested in the mineral composition that we model to be stable, we predict to be stable. Whereas when we just want the for one model to uh, predict what could eventually happen for uh, a, a basaltic composition at uh, 25 uh, kilobar and uh, 600 degrees, where you form omphacite, garnet, and, and so on. The, in this case, the forward model is good enough. It is always perfect. You can reproduce the metamorphic phases and you will easily see how the minerals are changing with pressure and temperature condition. And that's cool. What is cool about those uh, forward petrological models is that you can explore scenarios. And the last part of my presentation is exactly about that and how we can develop, build on the, on the power of this forward model to investigate the fluids. And this part uh, has been, uh, the, the work on this, pan, on, on this part has been done by a PhD student, Alice Vaux, who, who just finished uh, 
uh, a, a PhD last year, and she worked on an extension of the petrological model. So here you can see at the beginning of the sketch, you have again the 4-1 model with the Gibbs energy minimization where you, you, you simulate mineral assemblage, mineral modes, and the mineral compositions. And on top of that, we added a mass balance calculation based on a, a database, an internally consistent database for uh, oxygen fractionation factors that can calculate the delta weighting of all the minerals that are in equilibrium and the delta weighting of the fluid that would be in equilibrium with the minerals. And then we can put this calculation in a loop program that will consider a multi and a multi rock and open system behavior. So you can simulate how the fluid will circulate between different rock types and how this would change the delta weighting composition, so the isotopic composition of the different minerals. And now I have an, a second PhD student, Austin, that is working on expanding that to more uh, complex situation. So the work of Alice was uh, to produce this package of tools, including first the DB oxygen, that is database, it's an internally consistent database containing fractionation factors for 100, 157 mineral phases. It is internally consistent, and this is very important. It means, it means that you can use the data all together. They are fully compatible. It's based on a primary data for 408 mineral pairs, and the primary data are either experimental data, natural data, or theoretical data. And we consider all those constraints simultaneously weighted by the type of the data because you don't have the same uncertainty. You have experiments with large uncertainty, other experiments more recent with smaller uncertainty and so on. So we consider that as well. And then we derive the fractionation factors plus their uncertainties, depending on the constraints that we have. So if we have few constraints, you would have a, a, a relatively, or if, if we have a disagreement between the constraints, you would have a large uncertainty. If you have uh, no disagreement between the constraints, you would have very small uncertainty. We provided with the database all the data plots for all the pairs, which means that if you are interested in using the database for, uh, let's say, the equilibrium between two different minerals, then you can go into the supplementary material and you can check what are the experimental constraints that we have for this uh, pair. Then Alice provided as well two programs, two modeling tools. The first one is PT loop, and PT loop allows you to do thermodynamic plus oxygen isotope fractionation modeling. You can consider a multi rock system, you can simulate free rock interaction, and especially you can simulate or you can uh, transfer the fluids between the different rock types that you have in your system. And she also developed a very cool tool for thermometry. If you want to do thermometry using oxygen isotopes, the program is called Thermox and it's available as a standalone app. And you can simply enter the values that you measure for your two minerals. And from the database, using the data of the database, it will calculate the temperature and the uncertainties. So I want to, to, to show uh, how, uh, a bit how complicated this work was. And here I'm showing you all the plots of the different mineral pairs. So it really shows you the, the result of the fit of this internally consistent database for oxygen isotope fractionation. And you, you can see the data in blue and green with the uncertainty. And then we have the model in black and it's uncertain, the uncertainty of the model. But now the scientific question is, can we really use those oxygen isotopes uh, data or values to trace the invisible fluid pathway. Because especially with aqueous fluids, it, is, it can be very tricky to say if you had interaction with an external fluid in your rock. And because it can have little or no effect on the rock if the rock is already saturated, for example, in H2. So we focused with a, a second PhD student on a, a very nice uh, part of the ALF of the Alps, and this is a drone photo of the Theodule Glacier unit, the TGU, that's everything you see in the middle that is a bit rusty, these colors. And it is just above Zermatt in the Swiss Alps, and it's embedded in the Zermatt SAS uh, unit, uh, in the rocks of the Zermatt SAS unit. 
So this is the this is the, the, the accretionary prism of the oceanic subduction in the Western Alps. And then inside the oceanic units, where well, you have uh, serpentinites, you have metagabro, metabasalt, and kalkschist. And inside you have this these rocks that are different, and those are volcano uh, sedimentary uh, rocks with a, a slightly different composition. And that's why you see it so well on this photo. And the question that we had is, uh, where are the fluids circulating during uh, high pressure metamorphism? Is it circulating only in the Zermatsas unit? Is it circulating also in the Theodule Glacier unit? Uh, when as the, are the fluids circulating during prograde metamorphism? Uh, where you have, for example, the brucite out reaction in the serpentinite that produces quite a lot of fluids. This is near the peak conditions, prograde to, to peak pressure conditions. Or is it during the exhumation? Because during the exhumation, we have, at some stage, we cross the loss nitrate down reaction. So we will again release quite a lot of fluids. And for that, Thomas uh, spent quite a long time in the field in there, in this small area, collecting several samples. And he focused the analysis on the garnet. And here I'm showing you compositional maps of garnet for three different samples. Uh, the first one on the top uh, is, uh, or the first two samples are uh, mafic rocks. The one on the bottom is uh, chloritoid schist. And then the maps are grossula, the first column, the second is almondine, third one is pyrope, and the fourth one is spersotin. What is interesting is that, especially for the two samples in the middle and at the bottom, we have this, this core that is depleted in, uh, in x grossula, so it's depleted in calcium, and is surrounded by a, a rim that is enriched in calcium. And from a thermodynamic point of view, it's quite interesting because when you see this kind of, uh, of uh, texture, this contact between the core and the rim, you would say, okay, I had a strong event of resorption of garnet before I crystallized the rim. And if you look at the oxygen isotopes, the values are shown in the slide as well. The core, especially for the sample in the middle, has a delta 18 value of 9.5 per mil, whereas the rim will be between 1.7 and 2.6 per mil. On the last sample, the core is 10 per mil, whereas the rim is only 3 per mil. So we have a jump in oxygen between the core of the garnet and the rim of the garnet. And here the garnet were dated and they are all alpine. So they all crystallized during uh, uh, subductions, well, prograde garnet, and then you have crystallization of garnet as well along the retrograde path. But it is all alpine. And if we summarize all the, the analysis of delta 18 in the Theodule Glacier unit, what you can see is we have those cores of garnet that are uh, preserving a uh, and then reach a delta 18 signature around 10 per mil. And then we have all those rocks with a lower uh, value, including the rim, the rims of the small garnet. So the key findings of Thomas is that if you want to explain this jump in the samples, and you observe this jump in many samples, and everywhere in the sample is not only just one garnet grain, and we measured several garnet grains at the scale of the thin section, and you always observe this jump. And the jump is caused by a low delta 18 external fluid because you need to change the reactive uh, oxygen uh, composition of your system, of, of your reactive system. You need to change the power composition in delta 18. And we need a fluid that is coming from a serpentinite dehydration that is required really to observe, to, to generate this drop of about 8 per mil in delta 18. So then we use PT loop. We use all the programs that were produced to calculate if we know the delta 18 of fluid that is uh, produced by the, by the serpentinite, then we can calculate how much fluid you need to create this jump, assuming, of course, that the fluid was reacting with the rock. And what we ended up with is uh, calculating a time integrated uh, fluid flux that is shown here on this figure by the small uh, blue dot. And we discovered that is, in this case, the Theodule Glacier unit was acting as an open system. So we are talking about fluids that were circulating along the unit, and um, uh, we are talking not about fluids circulating along veins, but pervasive fluids that allow it the re-equilibration of the rock. So it's pervasive fluid flow at the kilometer scale under high pressure.
conditions. And then Thomas calculated the permeability value that is associated to this, and we found a quite uh, uh, low permeability value, about 10 to minus 19 um, uh, uh, square meter that is estimated for this schist at high pressure condition, but which, which means that the fluids were able to travel through the rocks. And they left a signature that we can see in the delta open values. So now, now that, that uh, we have seen that, those, those are important processes. But if we want to be able now to model those processes, we need to, to take into account uh, the mechanical effect. So our, our fluid can mechanically travel through a rock. And uh, I have a second PhD studio, student, actually, Hugo, that is working on that and is developing a mechanical model using the two-phase flow model to simulate with a time loop how the fluids are circulating through a rod. And now if we put everything together, so we have the Gibbs energy minimization, we have the mass balance calculation, and then if we couple that with the two-phase flow model, it means that we, we get somehow a new model of metamorphism in which you can predict how the fluids would also uh, migrate in different rock types and interact in the rocks. So the way I see the future of uh, modeling metamorphic processes is to have a custom model geometry to uh, run this model through a PT loop, for example, and see how the fluids can interact between the different uh, rock types. And that's about all. So that's uh, what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, that was my geek approach. And maybe to, to quickly summarize what I have presented, uh, I presented you a new version of XMAP tools. And I hope I demonstrated that it is important to, to use quantitative compositional maps when you, are doing, when you are doing metamorphic petrology. And I'm sure the applications are as important in uh, other disciplines if you work with solids. Then I presented Bing Antidote that implements a full iterative thermodynamic model that is also important for thermobarometry, especially if you have the presence of metastable phases. And this is, in my opinion, often the case and often underestimated uh, in, uh, in the studies focused on thermobarometry. I also showed you that we can use Gibbs energy minimization for forward simulation of metamorphism coupled with uh, uh, a, a geochemical model, that's what I call a petrol geochemical model. And we use that to simulate free rock interactions uh, and to track the fluids using oxy oxygen isotopes. And then at the end, uh, I, I said that I think it's really critical if we want to, to develop the next generation of models to simulate metamorphism, to take into account the fluid and to be able to integrate the fluid directly into the model. And th that will also bring another, another variable that we do not consider in our petrological models, that is the time. Because if you have a fluid migrating in your system, you need to consider the time. So I thank you uh, all for attending this presentation and thanks again uh, the conveners for inviting me today. Thank you, Pierre, your amazing talk. Really nice. We are reading uh, several comments through uh, the chat and also uh, other people are sending uh, congratulations. Uh, we have here Professor Fabricio from FMG saying that they, it's a very good subject and talk. And Kai, <laughs> Kai <laughs> attended the, <laughs> the invitation as well and as yeah, I have to agree with him that it's always nice to see you, you, and that uh, people from the geological survey um, joined him in attending the talk. I have a proof of that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I will put some comments here for you. Look, <laughs> and if someone have a question, so. And I I think it's really nice because this is all like uh, examples. I mean, of course, it's, it's nice for the research itself that you are doing amazing uh, research. And, and it's amazing that you are sharing that uh, with the scientific community and allowing us to, uh, to use them as well. Uh, I'm always 
uh, very excited to make several questions, but uh, we have some in the chat and also the other conveners. So I, I, I will keep mine to the end this time. Well, the other at the end. <laughs> Congratulations uh, for your talk. I think it's, I'm a big fan of your work, of course. Uh, and it always really shows me that we have too many simplistic ways of trying to resolve problems and your work and the compositional maps and now the fluids coming along, it just shows that it's much more deep and complex than we thought before. And I think you are doing an amazing job. And and just by doing this, uh, making like a open code, everybody can access and change it or modify as they want it. It's really nice. So the community, I'm pretty sure that it's very happy with it. I, I hope we could share the load. Yes, that would be yeah. nice. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. Thank you. It's a uh, it's great comments. And uh, I have a question. Can I make a question now? Yeah. Yeah. Please. All right. So, right in the end of your presentation, uh, you said that it's re really critical to tie the fluid circulation with time. So, how do you think we could do that? But it, so. It's a tricky question. Yeah. <laughs> we are working on that. <laughs> That's the <laughs> way. <laughs> now the so the the thing that is tricky is so if you know the mechanical properties of your solid and your rock and uh, then you can simulate this, this two phase flow, then you will have a you will have a, a fluid moving in your system with time. So yeah. it, it, it's the model that will give you that. Then what is important for us is uh, how can we benchmark that because. Two phase flow models exist since 20 years. And you can see these very nice uh, 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 waves of fluid going through your, your model. And the question is, how do we benchmark that? How do we say, yes, I can say that the, the fluid should have traveled at this specific PT condition through the rock. And I know the quantity. So in our case, we know the time integrated fluid flux. So then we can design a model that will try to reproduce that. So to say, okay, we need at least that amount of fluid to travel through the rock in uh, one million year, for example. Yeah. So the idea is that really, again, to couple the model with uh, the constraints that we have. And now we, uh, especially, I mean, collaborating with people in uh, isotope uh, geochemistry, and, and they do amazing things. They can measure very small spots in the garnet, they can get a precision in the uh, delta weighting composition that is really amazing. And now we can start to interpret those signals and uh, to yeah. quantify the, 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 how much fluid you need to change the, the signal. Yeah, my question comes more from the geochronological side because I work a lot of appetites and appetites are pretty good to record uh, fluid flow. But yeah. appetites that are more fluid altered, they are much more common lead and richard and mostly the ages are pretty crap. So nowadays we are just uh, putting a little bit more effort on Rubidi Strongstream in situ on Michael's because that's actually when, so our new paper on JMG is showing that different Michael's with different microstructures and chemistry have different ages as well. So this kind of could help constraining the fluid flow and coupling chemistry, Michael chemistry and Rubidi Strongstream in situ, which is a new technique more or less. You're right. The mica is great, and uh, we are trying to expand the oxygen analysis to the mica. Yeah. Uh, the, the the problem with mica is it tells you that fluid has been around because you see some re-equilibration locally. Yeah. Uh, what it doesn't tell you is how much fluid you get. Uh, you know that you had some fluid, but do, the, it could be internal fluid that is produced by the dehydration of one mineral, and just allowing the mica to to, to go to equilibrium, so to, to re-equilibrate partially, but it doesn't tell you how much fluid is, is, is yeah. struggling. Yeah, in our case, it's it's shocking. It's a lot of fluid. It's really, really a lot. If you want to change the, the signal like that, you really need to have a, a strong interaction with fluid. And the, yeah. it's significant in terms of volume. I cannot, uh, I cannot, uh, I don't have the, I, I should extrapolate that to, to, to have an image to explain how the volume is important. But it is quite important. It's not, yeah. for example, so no, I have an image. For example, so all in the surrounding of, of the this TGU unit, you have a lot of uh, meta meta basalts, uh, uh, 
with uh, probably pseudomorphoflucenide. There were quite a lot, a significant amount of of, of, lucenide, of lucenide all over. And if you if you take all the fluid that would be produced by the dehydration of the lucenide, that's quite a lot of fluid, and you make that interact in the in the TG unit, you decrease the delta weighting of about one to two per mil, if I remember well. So it's nothing compared to what yeah. we see. So what we see is a really a, a, a probably a large channel of fluid going through the unit at some stage. And it and it happens, we, we, we can really say when it happens, and it happens close to this loss night out reaction. But the fluid is going from deeper down from the dehydration of the subcontinent. So it, it, it is quite a lot. But I fully agree the mica are, are, are super important. And it, it, if you can come with um, with timing, uh, that would be also critical for the model to say, yes, we know when the fluid pulse is where, and that's very important for us. So get in touch. If you yeah. have published data that we can we can use in the model, that would be really amazing. Yeah, that'd be cool. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, we have a question from Eleanor Bleho. No, I don't know. Bloro. Uh, she said, a great talk, Pierre. You showed modeling of pelites in XMAP tools and big antidote compatible. Ah, is it XMAP tools and bingo antidote compatible with make rocks such as the green models? The big problem. <laughs> it is to some extent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, we, we have a few models we did with the green model. So it, it is implemented. It, uh, it, it's similar. I can reproduce most of the diagram that they published in the 2016 paper. So yes, we have it. Some, but it can be tricky if you have phases that we didn't model because so the challenge there is not a is not a is not a, a modeling challenge. It's just that the Bingo antidote should be able to communicate with Tariac Domino. So if you have an amphibole, Bingo should know what amphibole is and in which phase it is in your sample, which is amphibole, and which model of amphibole you are using in Tariac Domino. So the communication between the two is, uh, is one file that makes a translation in terms of model names. So if you go with the public version of Bingo Antidote and you have a phase that we haven't considered, that is not in the translation, then it will fail. But this is usually something that is quite easy to fix. The main problem is I, I have to, to put some more efforts to make the programs compatible with um, the, the version of, uh, of Tayak Domino of Doug uh, Tinka. Uh, but I have to talk with Doug about that because uh, there are a few things that uh, we change things in Tayak Domino as well to make it fully compatible. So it's not compatible with all versions of Tayak Domino. So it's a bit of a mess at the moment. Okay, I have a quick question. Uh, thank you, Pierre, for such a great uh, talk. Uh, you talk about, uh, about the um, uh, equilibrium thermodynamics applied to natural rocks. And most people, a lot of people are interested in determining uh, peak metamorphic conditions, but most rocks, they uh, usually record like a lower pressure temperature conditions and mostly record heterometamorphic conditions. So that's why uh, these two you are providing to the community, the iterative thermodynamic modeling is uh, really great. Um, but it's uh, difficult sometimes to do like this perfect mismatch between observations and model. And then you were showing like if you select a different domain to try to get like um, a higher uh, Q value. But what would be like a minimum uh, acceptable <laughs> Q value? Like it's not always we are getting 92, 94 percent. So especially in, in high grade, especially ultra high temperature uh, rocks. Yeah, it, it will be uh, like quite difficult to to determine this. So that, that's several questions in one. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It, so the first thing, it makes your life more complicated. That's for sure. If you, you take your bulk core composition, calculate a phase diagram, your life will be easier. Uh, that's definitely the case. 
The iterative thermodynamic models are usually more complicated to, to read, to interpret. Uh, it can be tricky as well, depending on the situation. For example, if you have melt, you talk about melt, then of course the Q uh, volume will make no sense because in the model you will have melt. And uh, it, means, it, it means that what you are using in the, in the reactive bulk composition or in your composition is the, the product of the, melt, of the crystallization of your melt. So then it, it makes the whole story more complicated. Uh, yeah, with melt, it is, it, it is complicated with melt, to be fully honest. But uh, there, and, and the, the, so that, that's the first point. With melt, it is complicated. The second point is there is no acceptable value of QCMP. So, what we have is we have recommendation. For example, if you use Garnet, we know that uh, you should reach a QCMP value of 100% because the models are pretty good. If you use a biotite, we know that you will never reach a QCMP value of 100% because the biotite models cannot reproduce what we observe in some cases. Uh, in this case, a value of 80% would be very good. Another, uh, another problem is that if you look at different, so the, the, the function that we invert is, is quite complex because if you want the QCMP values, they are relevant within one assemblage field. Within one assemblage field, you can compare the QCMP values. That would be like searching for the best intersection of your isoplates in one assemblage. If you have two different assemblages, then it gets tricky because you are not comparing the same things. So you should exactly. not compare the QCMP values between two different stability field. Like in Big Matiza, we'll have like a, a melt rich uh, domain and a melt poor domain. And uh, of course, they will uh, produce very different uh, Q values as well. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. But in the Big Matiza, what you should be able to, to model quite precisely. And we, we did that a long time ago. That was the inspiration of, uh, of Big Antidot, but it never went published, is that you can really predict what happens when you crystallize the melt. So from a domain where you had a lot of melt to, to another domain where you had less melt. And this, you can easily do it, yes. Okay. But, but to come back to the stage where the melt was present, being wanted that will not use, will, will not be helpful for this. So, yes. And it's, yeah, and it's the same if you have strongly zoned minerals, then being wanted that will, will be, a, what do you do? So then you have to you have to, to say yourself, oh, I want to isolate the core of the garnets. And this you can do it, but it's something you have to do before to send the data to, to being wanted. So it's not a magic tool. It's absolutely not a magic tool. And in most of the cases, you will end up with very similar pressure and temperature conditions. It's just, it's a more realistic approach because you can focus on what was eventually at equilibrium. And in some good cases, you can test it. And this yes. is quite nice. And okay. To, and to finish, we have some uh, automated tools to check. So we have options where the domain will change by itself, and you can see how this will impact your result. Okay, thank you very much. Just a quick question regarding the um, XMAP tools. So the um, laser maps, they are really nice and have been widely applied, especially to Garnet. So it's a very nice mineral, a major phase that we can uh, yeah, apply these uh, trace uh, element maps. But uh, how about extending to um, other phases, especially accessory phases? Uh, we have a lot of interest, especially on zircon, monazite. Um, if we are already able to do that on XMAP tools or uh, soon? <laughs> so soon. In the yes. new version, so in the new version, you can read the data not from all instruments, but uh, you can read the data from uh, one instrument for sure. Then, if you send me the data, we make it compatible with your instrument. Uh, the thing that was challenging, and that's why we have been, we have been focusing on Garnet mostly, is that it's very it's easy to measure, as you said, mm -hmm. all the elements that should be in, in inside, uh, and it's and you have always one element that is completely flat like silicon, it's not zone yes. silicon, so you can use the, the amount of silica as internet standard. Uh, now we are focusing on fungite. We try to, to map amphibole, fungite, or other minerals, but they are zoned. 
So yes. in the new version of the program, we have a, a special routine to calibrate the maps where you have zone minerals. So you will be able to do it directly in the program. But of course, it will have to be, I mean, it's a lot of work. Uh, uh, there are professional people producing software for that. So it's, it's a lot of work. And what, what we would need is a, a community effort to send me some data to make the tools compatible with all the type of data you can have. So it might take some time in this. Oh, that's awesome. So we are looking forward to that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pierre. You're welcome. You will get a lot of data tomorrow on your email, I guess. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I have a filter. <laughs> Pierre, thank you. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, Otavio asks, Pierre, is there a difference between modeling PT conditions in subsolidus and suprasolidus with bingo antidote? Or is the same procedure? So to me, it's the same answer as what I already said to Brenda. Is, uh, it, it is different. It is different because you have to melt. So, uh, it, it is different and then there are strategies but it, it gets a bit uh, it gets complicated so uh, of course you can try things for example you can try to uh, uh, you can try to, to to look at small systems where you have the minerals that were coexisting with melt uh, you can try to ignore you can in uh, in being wanted that you can ignore q volume so you can ignore the modes and only focus on the composition and the assemblage, ignoring also, for example, the melt phase. So that, that's options that we are developed. We have already developed. But uh, but usually, if you have a, if you, if you have melting, it it gets more complicated. So Pierre, we had also George Lubizotto and Regiane Pumis uh, that your there are your collaborators congratulating you for the talk. I also have a question because as uh, as you have seen, sometimes uh, here in Brazil, we face this problem also with the high temperature rocks and that uh, we don't have the minerals on it uh, anymore. And, uh, and the trace elements open for us a new uh, hope, let's put this way. And with the oxygen isotopes, uh, I was also wondering, have you seen some garnet that it's not zoned for major elements, but it uh, preserves the, the oxygen isotope? I think uh, that would be something interesting for us to, to try to apply as well. So we, yeah, there is one case I could find the paper. I don't have it now uh, in my mind. It's a paper from um, uh, a postdoc of Daniela. And uh, uh -huh. there is one paper uh, where they, they found a correlation between zoning uh, ultra high temperature rocks between oxygen and phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And phosphorus in garnet is one of the the, the, the element you can use to see zoning that has been completely flattened by other uh, for other elements, and they found a correlation. So they they concluded in this paper it's a, a few years back that mm -hmm. the, the diffusion in oxygen is very low. So you have you, you don't have a sluggish. So you don't have much diffusion of uh, oxygen in uh, in garnet of yeah for the delta weighting signal. But the problem is, if you go to high temperature, then the the fractionation curves are going to are, are tending to zero. So mm -hmm. it means that the higher the temperature is, the less fractionation you have between your minerals. Yeah. So the less you will see small changes in uh, in a, in a delta weighting composition. So maybe not good for for um, extreme conditions in terms of temperature, but perhaps for for our higher temperatures eclogites in Northeast Brazil, something. Yeah, that and the other try. thing is that you need a contrast in, uh, in, the, in between the composition of the fluid and the composition of the rock. So if you have an eclogite mm -hmm. in the middle of uh, other mafic units, uh, and you have the fluid that is produced by the mafic unit interacting with another mafic unit, uh, it will be a fluid already in equilibrium in terms of uh, uh, isotopic composition with the rock. So what you want is to have meta sediments that will produce fluid that interact with mafic rocks or the other way around. Uh, 
uh, an ultra mafic fluid uh, or produce a fluid produced by ultra mafic drugs that will interact with meta sediment. That would be ideal because then you have a, a jump, uh, a large difference, a large disequilibrium between them in terms of uh, 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 oxygen. The signature. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I have another question, quick one. It's uh, every time I use XMAP tools for garnets, for example, I always think about major elements diffusion. And there is, have you ever thought, or there is any way of implementing like an add on to use major element diffusion on XMAP tools for garnets? That would be yeah. very handy. It is a project. So if you are willing to collaborate on that, you are more than welcome to help. Yeah. <laughs> we have, we yeah. have many I, projects. <laughs> I, I've talked to Maida about this before because I have some garnets that I was really interested in doing this. And I think the XMAP2 is the perfect platform because you already have the maps, you have the elements, everything's already calculated, and then you just need to put on the equation pretty much. Kind so, yes, it, it is definitely a project, but uh, uh, one has to go through a, a few steps before. So, we don't yeah. have and uh, so yeah we are trying to to speed up a bit the the calculation so for diffusion models so we are speeding up that uh we are working on that but it's a it's a side project so yeah i imagine <laughs> but i yeah. ultimately yes i have i always wanted to do that to say okay you can zoom in on your map say okay i have a transition that is smooth that's my final profile exactly. i want to start from a, a step function so you the and then let's go diffusion. But yeah, uh, yeah it, it is tricky. So one needs to really take a serious look at it. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll talk to you about it. For example, just one more, uh, 30 seconds in that. For diffusion, I always have the problem of, if you look at the models, if you take, for example, Mark uh, Kedick's paper, uh, yeah. you see calcium diffusing like hell. And, uh, and when you take my, <laughs> my maps, you see calcium with very step function and the iron magnesium really flat. So uh, there is something in diffusion to to improve in the in yeah. the in the diffusion model. And, uh, I have a yeah. few ideas, but we need time. Yeah, definitely. And I and I think that increasing the resolution it actually brings much more information to try to solve problems like this. So yeah. be before because before we, we only had like transacts on the maps and now we have the whole map like quantified. And then it's easier. We can isolate domains and check, like, right in the boundaries to see how things work. Yeah. So what we 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 have one paper with the diffusion of trace elements, and what was really nice is to say, okay, let's do several transects, not just one, because if yeah. you take one, you get one value, and then you take another. But no, they are slightly variable. So what we did is to have several transects and to do the diffusion for all of them and to see how, how it impacts your your results and i think this is important because sometimes you see that the, on your map that uh, on one side you have a very nice diffusion profile and then on the other side it's a bit more sharp so maybe it can be can be maybe diffusion is not the reason why you have this uh, smooth transit or the smooth yeah. profile yeah yeah I, I have exactly this case and in some parts the transition is very sharp and others are more like smooth kind of transitional so you could, so yeah, if you would have the, the tool in the program, then you could have different transects and try to solve that because yeah, it would also add a, another constraint that you are, if you have different transects and you, you try to, you could, you could start to think how to invert the model, but it's. Yeah, yeah. cool, thanks. Cool idea. And yeah, <laughs> yeah it's cool. Uh, I have some like more philosophical questions because it's really nice when you provide your uh, petrochronology uh, talks and also in the book, uh, you discuss how uh, things have evolved since um, uh, the, the first approach in which you, we performed the spot analysis to profiles, to maps, and how have everything has evolved. And uh, you, you authors uh, sent to us the message, is it uh, evolution or revolution? And now you are showing us another step with uh, several programs that um, changing our point of view and changing also uh, the results several times. So I want to ask you, and also you have shown that XMAP tools has uh, machine learning. How do you see machine learning 
uh, for us, uh, metamorphologies, it comes more like uh, evolution or revolution. Are we prepared for, for the change that are uh, about to come from that? That's a very good question. That's a very <laughs> good question. Uh, do you have an hour to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> so, See you in another talk. <laughs> to me, in the next five years, it will change a lot because uh, it, it's a recent development. So the deep learning, uh, the, the new deep learning models are really recent. Um, usually we apply in, in metamorphic petrology, we apply concepts in physics that were developed 100 years ago or, or maximum 60 years ago, 60 years ago. But now, no, we have access to, to tools that are pretty amazing. Uh, and it is easy to access. Actually, it's quite easy. If you, if, you, if you are used to do programming and things like that, you can really design your first machine learning models quite easily. I'm not saying that it will give you good results, but at least it's easy to get started. And, and we have access to more and more data. So the, the, only, the only frontier is uh, how do you connect all the data together and how do you make your computer program uh, learn from that huge data set. And people are doing that. Um, if you go to uh, computer and geosciences, we are publishing papers every every month on how machine learning has changed the, all the disciplines. And I think metamorphic petrology is coming there as well. Uh, same, many ideas. We need time to, to, <laughs> to do it, but it is pretty amazing. So I have a couple of examples for me for, for example, what we are doing with my around the classification, it is really efficient and it's not the most recent uh, models, but uh, already going back to what was done in mathematics 15 years ago is already impressive. It's a, it's a step forward in terms of classification, but now we can classify very complex maps uh, instantaneously and with uh, uh, an excellent precision. That was not the case before. Uh, the next step is to go to the to neural networks and deep learning and uh, we are trying to do that as well but it takes time it takes time but it, but i think that if, if you are using computer or if you if you know how to code and i would be curious about machine learning because there are super cool things and it's quite easy to implement then what is difficult is how to know how to design the model how to train the model and how to test that the model is doing what you want that it does. But uh, I find it completely, it, it, it really changed my perspective for the next 10 years. Let's put it that way. That's really nice. So thank you, Pierre, again for the amazing talk. I also want to thank um, Brenda and Bruno for joining us today, Mariana, and people there that are in the backstage from the Petrochronics that are, uh, it's Cristina Araújo, Lucas Schiavetti, Lucas Tesse, Otávio Santana, or, uh, Marco Pinheiro that you know, and Hugo Oliveira that uh, we are all working together in building uh, these talks and um, the content that goes in our network. And um, thank you so much. It was an amazing talk. And for sure, we will need uh, other opportunities to, to continue developing this discussion. And uh, I'm very excited as well for the release of XMAC 2 Sport. And yeah, let's see. Thank you so much. Th thanks to you. That was really <laughs> fantastic. And keep going. It's very important to have these kind of initiatives. And I, I hope you will continue like that for a long time. And then we'll try to join the, the, the next uh, talks and, and follow the network. It's really cool. And, uh, I love it. I really love it. <laughs> Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Pierre, for being with us.